And today I've got an expert on temperatures, and he is Professor John Christie. Uh, Professor Christie graduated with a BA in mathematics from the California State University at Fresno in 1973. So he's been out of the academic cage uh, released then. He was then in, uh, got his master's degree in 1978, got a master of science, that was a master in theology, correct, Professor Christie? Yes. Master of Atmospheric, Master of Science degree from the University of Illinois in 1984 and did his doctoral degree in 1987 from the University of Illinois. Now I'm holding the CSIRO in Australia, you know the CSIRO, accountable, um, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industry Research Organization for their temperature claims and for claims that politicians make based upon them. The CSIRO relies on models, is that correct? Well, for all projections, yes, these groups, these national science groups uh, do rely on models um, uh, to understand what is supposed to have happened with the climate and what might happen in the future. And what do you think of the quality of the CSIRO's models? Well, I've looked at the access models. These are the Australian models and uh, their very latest versions are unfortunately not uh, up to par in terms of the fact they do not match what has happened in the real world in the last 42 years. We have these upper air temperature measurements. And I like to use upper air temperature because that's the bulk of the atmosphere. It's not contaminated by things at the surface like parking lots or uh, city growth and so on. And so you're looking at the free atmosphere, a real physical measurement with lots of mass. And what the uh, access models show for that does not match what we see with the actual temperature data. And why is that? Why is the mismatch? Well, that's probably a real complicated thing, but uh, ultimately it's that the models are too sensitive to carbon dioxide. They, uh, in the way the model is written, it responds very easily to increases in carbon dioxide and probably doesn't have the real processes in the atmosphere that allow the Earth to let heat escape properly. And so the heat builds up in the model. Okay. And, and then if you apply today's models to those years when it was very warm um, thousands of years ago, what's the result? Well, there was a famous paper just a couple of weeks ago that uh, uh, when one of these models was put in the past where we know what temperatures were, this is back in the Eocene period, 50 million years ago or so, the planet warmed up to be 55 degrees Celsius. <laughs> well, the planet was never that hot during that period, uh, way too warm. And so this tells you that the models, this one small example here, that the models are too sensitive to carbon dioxide. Right. So for those uh, who don't understand what the professor means, he means that for slight increases in carbon dioxide, you get a dramatic in, in increase in temperature. So that's their sensitivity. And, and there, there are people who, um, reputable scientists around the world who differ on the impact of, of carbon dioxide and the sensitivity. So we've got some people who say slight increases in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere will produce dramatic increases in temperature. And we've got other people, Chillingar, Gerlich and Teuschner, accomplished uh, physicists who say that carbon dioxide, if you increase the level of carbon dioxide in the, in the Earth's atmosphere, you will decrease temperature. It'll have a cooling effect. And then we have people in the middle who say carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere will lead to either small increases in temperature or will lead to increases in temperature up to a certain low amount of carbon dioxide. And beyond that, we'll have very, very slight increases in temperature. And above that, we'll have no further increases. There's a, there's a maximum. So we've got no agreement on the carbon dioxide sensitivity of these climate models. Right. The magnitude of sensitivity of climate models, the very latest, 2020 we're talking about, climate models, the variation is a factor of three. <laughs> now, when a climate modeler says, oh, but my climate model is right because it's based on physics, well, I know what something based on physics means. It means when you drop a ball, you can figure out exactly at what time it's going to hit the ground. That's physics. When you have a factor of three difference among your climate models in their sensitivity, that tells you these are not based on physics. They are based on parameterizations and, and 
and theories that you have that have not been proven. And it also proves, to me anyway, it says to me that they don't understand what drives climate. Yeah, the, the climate is so complex. Our ignorance of the climate system is enormous. And I think it's played out when you see a climate model output that, it, it, first of all, it varies much from climate model to climate model. <laughs> and then in, in the climate model, it just simply doesn't match the real system we have out here, the real world. So what they're really saying is we've got so many climate models, they're so different, so we have taken care of everything, and then we average them. Well, no, no, what you're saying is that you don't understand much about the climate, and you're getting basically crap coming out, and you average the crap. That's what it's really saying. And I'm afraid that when you take the average of all that, it doesn't match up with the observations anyway. <laughs> right. So um, you mentioned models uh, before we started the re recording you mentioned you've used models to estimate what would happen to temperature if the united states shut up shop humans stopped exhaling carbon dioxide cars stopped industry stopped you stopped all human production of carbon dioxide what was the result well this was back in the uh, president obama administration and he was trying to promote uh, various legislative actions to save the planet, so to speak, reduce carbon dioxide. And so there were all kinds of um, uh, plans and legislative actions being proposed. And so when I went to testify before Congress, I did the simple calculation. I just said, well, let's just make the United States disappear. Just take away every person, every car, every factory and so on. We disappear from the planet. And I did the calculation using these climate models to show that would only mean a difference in temperature of about a tenth of a degree by 2100. And so uh, the, the global temperature varies by more than that from month to month right now. It's up and down, up and down, and so on. So uh, this indicates that the legislative actions, which were just trying to take a little part of the United States emissions down, will have a negligible. We could never attribute some change out there in the future based upon a legislation that takes just the tiniest part. And yet every tiny part you take out of carbon dioxide emissions means you have to get your energy somewhere else and it will likely be a more expensive place. That takes money out of every American's pocket. And, and then, by the way, we'll make our projections um, to 2100 so that we can never be tested by the current um, generation. You know, one of the plots I'd like to make is I start in 1980 and go to 2100 and show the model output rising, the rising temperature. Well, I've got 40 years, so that's 120 years. I've got 40 years of real data. So I show what the real data is doing and saying, we are already one third of the way through this test. And we already know these models have failed this test. Why would you ever believe the numbers out there at 2100 when you know in 2020 they're already very wrong? Wow. And so um, that, uh, uh, that again indicates you should not use these models for policy because they're already uh, running too warm. So and, and some people are starting, some even of the uh, IPC sci scientists and so on, some of those folks are starting to you know, kind of step back and say, yeah, we can't cover up this story anymore. <laughs> wow. Uh, it, it, it is a problem. <clears throat> wow. Uh, in, in, um, you, you've testified 20, 20 times before the Senate and the House? Yes. And uh, in a 2009 written testimony to the U.S. House Ways and Means Committee, you wrote, I'm going to quote, from my analysis, the actions being considered to stop global warming will have an imperceptible impact on whatever the climate will do while making energy more expensive and thus have a negative impact on the economy as a whole. We have found that climate models and popular surface temperature data sets overstate the changes in the real atmosphere and that actual changes are not alarming. Yes, I had done uh, uh, several experiments, both for a court case as well as some other uh, hearings in which I tried to test the impact of specific legislation. So I would take a climate model 
and say, okay, I'm going to change the CO2 amount in that climate model by what your legislation says it will change because we somehow remove carbon dioxide. The effects were imperceptible. So all of the agony and pain of going through obeying new laws about building windmills or solar panels or whatever that are very expensive and unreliable, the costs are huge on those things, and the output of reduced carbon dioxide just will not affect the climate that can be uh, uh, attributed uh, to such a regulation. So you couldn't attribute any change in the future to these expensive regulations, and it wouldn't have much effect at all anyway. I love your clear thinking. 